scanning for audio. Welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast, this time talking more Blake 7. Ah, it's the summer of Blake 7. How simply lovely. It's episode 4, it's Time Squad. We left our noble heroes with Federation pursuit ships in the background. Yes, those exciting Federation pursuit ships doing what they do best, which is pursuing and then not quite managing to pursue fast enough because they're just Federation ships. But that's fine. Bring on episode four. Yes, they're all patting themselves on the back, going, isn't it great? We can just go so fast, we can outstroll these ships. We can run away very quickly. And let's face it, as a survival technique, running away rocks. It just works. However, Blake wants to take the attack to the Federation's door. They're supposed to be... Well, a sort of collective making decisions as a group, which is nice, in a kind of Monty Python kind of a way, and just in a Monty Python kind of a way, all collective decisions are made after massive amounts of discussion, and oh hang on, no they're not. Blake kind of announces that he wants to give the Federation a good kicking, and then there's nothing like a good kick in the communication centres to get someone's attention. Now, do you want their attention, or do you just want to knock out their communications ability? I'm not quite sure. Yes, all of a sudden, Blake's got all of his memories back and he understands that the Federation genuinely aren't the good guys. They've behaved quite abominably by knocking out ruthlessly um, a little world somewhere. So this is what we'll call the A-plot. The A-plot is let's go to this world. Now, the story's called Time Squad, which is possibly the worst title for a story going. Nation was not good at titles. Or perhaps he was. You expect some sort of time travel story, and as an audience member, that's kind of what you'd signed up for. It's not going to happen, but let's let that go. So, without a huge amount of discussion, they head off, Blake's, several at this point, but definitely not seven, in the direction of Saurian Major. Yes, indeed, I know people have said it sounds like a dinosaur, and it does, but let's just head that way anyway. On the way, they come across an episode of Star Trek. Yes, Khan is frozen in... Oh, hang on, no. They find a large silver pod. A spaceship. Quite nicely designed, quite small. And they beam across, or whatever you want to call it. Teleport, let's stick with that. They teleport across to the pod. Find out that, well, you know, there's not a lot of life support on it. Oh, and we've also got a mention of Zen wanting to help, but not quite managing it. A curious arrangement. You get the feeling that iPads are the same. They want to help, but really they're just there to infuriate you. Or is it the other way around with Samsung? We'll leave that there. Everyone knows my feelings on Apple products, or mainly the people who own them. And it's worth you really going into. So this, which we won't call the B-plot... We'll call it plot number one, is Time Squad. Yes, they're on their way to give the Federation a good kicking, but they're also easily distracted, mainly by boredom, by this spaceship. Let's bring it on board, they all say, and they do, using Avon's deft fingers. Yes, if you want to read things into that sort of thing, feel free and laugh along with everyone else. But, you know, you can't really judge, can you? It's just the way things are. They bring the spaceship on board, despite the fact that Zen's trying to give them some warnings about not doing it. Villa says let's not do it, and Avon says let's not bother. I'm not quite sure why they do it. Ah yes, they're following Blake. And then they continue on their merry way to the little planet and beam down. Now, there is a reason for the whole Time Squad spaceship being on board, plot-wise, because 
If, like Doctor Who, you turn up somewhere, there's a bit of a threat, why don't you just get back in the TARDIS and leave? And they've spent 50 odd years figuring cunning ways round that. Well, in this story, why don't they just teleport out when things go wrong? Well, they can't do that, either because the spaceship's A in orbit and being attacked by people from the Time Squad ship. So that's kind of why both plots need to exist at the same time as each other. And that's why it isn't an A plot and a B plot, because with an A plot and a B plot, one of them's always secondary, one of them's always not as important, and that's not quite true here. That's actually stealthful and quite skillful writing. Thank you, Terry. It does feel a lot more Star Trek-y. They're on their way somewhere to do something for the good of all, and they get sidetracked by something that's going on, something from the past, something that needs to be felt. But yes, I know it feels like the Khan story, but it's not as important. Because Blake isn't Star Trek. Yes, it's the Star Trek logo on its side. So it's Star Trek taken from a new angle, allegedly, possibly, arguably. Hmm. But that's not important. What is important is that this episode manages to have a really nice collection of character moments. Jenna and Gan have a brilliant moment about Gan's limiter. Admittedly, it doesn't mean that he can't kill. It's all very vague and not really gone into. There is a not very popular theory that Gan's issue is more of a a dubious crime. Because later on he's described as a monster for having a limiter, rather than just standard Federation practice. And the fact that his limiter doesn't work is what ends up with him being sent off. They said they killed his woman, this nameless person. Now whether that's standard 70s unwritten sexism, or whether it's something more sinister, it's all been argued elsewhere. I'm not sure I'm going to go with it at this point. What I am going to say is that it's well worth giving a think about it, not just accepting the whole thing at face value, as science fiction fans we are often prone to doing. Taking things at face value, yes, that's what we do. So yes, these dodgy, scantily clad people start thawing out, and you know whenever there's a set of cryogenic chambers, there's always one that fails, ooh, so that you know that the cryogenic fails. I know that's a whole Planet of the Apes thing, but it's so effective, and of course it's not just Planet of the Apes, it's a Twilight Zone thing, but as Planet of the Apes and Twilight Zone were both written by Rod Serling, yes they were, check it out, then that's fine. A broken cryogenic chamber does give credibility to how long people have been frozen. And yes, it's what people used to do. And there's gene banks and things like that. The whole thing doesn't really come across very good. The fact that, say, Blake could have just switched the gene banks on and had an instant army. Yes, let's not go there. It's all a bit Clone Wars for my liking. And clones, well, they'll turn up later on anyway. No. At its core, this story is more about characters. And one of the most important aspects of the whole story is Callie. Callie is the first non-human, well, non-native to Earth, and you will eventually find out f- a lot more about her. She is psychic. She is part of the R and R and R and R. Who one day you'll find out are a bunch of clone makers. She is vaguely psychic, psychic enough to be possessed at random points by other alien influences. Psychic enough to receive messages or to sense things, you know, in a kind of Counselor Troy kind of a way. Yes, Callie has the potential, because she is also a trained terrorist, or freedom fighter, depending on your reading, and that's a recurring theme of Blake 7. When you're an adult and you're watching these shows, that's something you've got to take into consideration. Are these people terrorists? If you're not part of the government, the main force, and you're outside of it trying to bring it down, you are, by definition, a terrorist, especially if you're using these tactics. Tactics that involve explosives, killing people. These people are terrorists. Yes, they may be right from our 20th century standpoint. This is the 70s after all. But in the 70s, England was under attack. That's England itself by the Irish, and by a host of other people from around the world. Our terrorism was homegrown, but these people still had a point. The point that they were trying to make, whether it was a right point or a wrong point, that's personal choice. Their methods, however, were not great. Lots of people ended up dead. 
And that was the 70s I grew up in. That's the 70s that was happening. And in France, you had something similar. In Spain, you also had something similar. People who saw themselves as freedom fighters, people who were using tactics that wouldn't look out of place in Blake 7, with the possible exception of some of the equipment used. That was the background that was going on. And that was what we were experiencing on TV. Perhaps it was more subversive than you think. So there is a terrorist, but she's the last surviving one, trying to take out the Federation communication base. So while A plot and number one plot go merrily on their way, we've got a brand new member of the crew. And I, for one, am pleased that we've got yet another woman on board. It's what we need. Now, yes, the teleportation system works, and it is worthy of mentioning, and I don't know if I did it last time, that in Blake 7 Rebellion Reborn, the adaptation or reboot on audio of Blake 7, this is not the Big Finish version. This is a completely separate version, but you can get it through Big Finish, and it has a very, very different cast, different interpretations, but they don't have teleportation technology because it's just as cheap on audio to land a shuttle to get people off. People can be cut off from shuttles so much easier than they can have their bracelets smashed. And how many? Is anyone keeping track of how many bracelets have been smashed so far? Ah, we'll get back to you on that one. And so next time we have what I can only describe as a slightly disappointing story, the web. So until next time, be seeing you. You've been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast, available on RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Audio Boom, and Tumblr. Doctor Who and its associated works are copyright of the BBC. No infringement is intended. You can contact the show, donate, buy merchandise, or find out more about my other projects by visiting the Tin Dog Podcast homepage and clicking on the links. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. On the 5th of September 2015, Hooverville will return. The biggest little Doctor Who convention in the whole of the UK is proud to present several fantastic guests. First off is THE Colin Baker, a man who needs absolutely no introduction. Guests also include the author Jenny Colgan, responsible for Dark Horizons and Time Trips, Richard Marson, the man behind GNT, The Life and Scandalous Times, and the brand new book, Drama and Delight, the biography of Verity Lambert, Dan Starkey, the man behind the mask when it comes to Commander Strax, and of course, Ian the Elf in the Christmas special, Terence Dix, one of the men behind The Third Doctor, and more target novelizations than you can shake a stick at, the actor David Benson, from Robot of Sherwood, Iris Wildheim, and The Scarifiers, Matthew Waterhouse, yes, Adrake, Michael Pickwood, the current production manager on Doctor Who, and Karen Louise Hollis, author of The Man Behind the Master, the biography of Anthony Inley. More guests may be added, but either way, that's a fantastic lineup. Visit the Derby Quad website on www.derbyquad.co.uk and follow the links. Saturday, the 5th of September 2015. See you there. Good